Hi guys, very welcome to Mentor, yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Now, have you ever wondered why the fin on the 737 looks a bit different than on other similar types? I'm going to explain all about it today, so stay tuned. Guys, this video is brought to you in cooperation with me. I wanted to highlight, guys, that I have a mobile application available. It's called Mentor Aviation. It's completely free to download and you have the links to it down here. It's for aviation enthusiasts where you can speak to other enthusiasts and you can speak directly to me and other professional pilots. You can also get training uh, collections in there. It's collections that I have made in order to show you guys exactly how we for example, set up a 737 from um, scratch until it's ready to taxi, or how we deal with things like engine failure, TCAS maneuvers, CAT 3 approaches. So check it out, once again, completely for free, down here. Today I want to talk about something that I'm getting continuously questions about from you guys. Um, people are out on the airport and they look at the 737 and they, they've noticed that the fin doesn't look exactly like it does on other aircraft. Um, instead of the fin intersecting the body at, a, at you know, the, the, um, a normal angle, it kind of changes angle and then it prolongs the fin out forward towards the, um, the direction of the wings. Now, in order to understand why it looks like this, we have to look at the, as always, the history of the 737 and how it has been uh, evolving over the different generations that it's gone through. But we also have to understand a little bit about the aerodynamics behind it and why there is a fin there in the first place. So a, f a fin of an aircraft is there to stabilize the flight. Okay, um, the, the fin provides the forces that turns the aircraft around the jaw axis, like this. Okay, um, when we're out flying, we use the rudder, the fin and the rudder in order to coordinate the turns. So we have a nice 1G feeling. It doesn't feel like you're falling in any direction, but it's just nicely coordinated. That's what the, the rudder does in normal flight. We also use it during crosswind landings, which I've made an episode about, by the way, in order to, um, to, to come in with a crab angle towards the wind and then de-crab just before landing. But when it comes to handling during an engine failure is where it's critical that the, um, the fin and the rudder is big enough because that's where it it's faces its biggest challenge. Now, I've done videos about how we handle engine failures. And once again, you can find how we actually do it in the collection inside of the app. But what you have to understand is that um, since the aircraft is fitted with engines out on the wings, those engines are quite far out from the center of the aircraft. And this is fine as long as you have two engines working perfectly. But if you, for example, during the takeoff would suffer an engine failure on one of the engines, well then the remaining engine will continue to push and it will effectively turn the entire aircraft, as in your the aircraft, towards the dead engine. V1, rotate, engine failure. Gear up. Awesome right. Now, at low speeds is where the rudder surfaces are least effective. And this means that if we have an engine failure at low speed, where we have high thrust set, like in the takeoff for example, well then the rudder needs to be big enough and the fin needs to be big enough in order to counteract that jaw. And even though we get that jawing feeling, we can straighten it up and continue either to stop straight ahead if it happens at very low speed or continue to fly if it happens after V1. So this is what the rudder has to do. And when the 737 first came, the 100 and the 200 were fitted with smaller engines. Okay, They were uh, low bypass turbofan engines and they had an output of about 16,000 pounds thrust each. Okay. Um, 
the engineers made the rudder and the fin big enough to be able to counteract the, uh, the jawing effect of an engine failure on that one. But when they started looking into how to, um, to prolong the aircraft and to fit it with more effective and more powerful engines, the CFM-56 that we have fitted to it now, they come up against a problem. And the problem was that the rudder just wasn't big enough. Okay. If they were fitting those bigger engines, the yawing moment would become much larger. And in that case, they needed a bigger fin and a bigger rudder to counteract it. There's two ways of doing that, okay? The most obvious way would be just to make the fin higher. Because if you make the fin higher, you have a bigger surface, you have a bigger rudder, and the problem is solved. But the problem with that was that most of the 737 customers at the time, like Southwest Airlines, for example, um, they were not too happy with the idea of increasing the, um, the height of the fin. Because they had already built hangars, uh, they had built places for it to do maintenance, uh, they were of a, big, of a certain size, and if the fin would become higher, well then the, the aircraft just wouldn't fit into the hangar. So, the engineers of Boeing came up with a different solution, and the solution they came up with is something called a dorsal fin. That's what you see, that part of the, uh, of the fin that doesn't intersect straight into the um, airframe, but prolongs, that's actually a different aerodynamic part. Uh, and what it does is that it increases the uh, surface and the size of the fin and the effectiveness of the rudder without increasing the overall size of the fin. So by doing this, Boeing had solved the problem. Um, and also, the, it is actually a fascinating aerodynamic detail, the, uh, the dorsal fin, because since it has a slightly different angle than the rest of the fin, it works kind of like a double delta wing on a fighter jet. So, since it has a lower um, angle, it means that it will not stall at the same angle of attack as the rest of the, uh, the fin will. It will stall at a higher angle of attack, which means that it, 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 it makes the fin less prone to stall at high slip angles, but also at really high slip angles, it creates a very high energy vortex that actually increases the energy over the rudder and makes the rudder more effective. And this is highly, you know, you won't notice it in normal flight, but when you have an engine failure, for example, during takeoff, in that case, it does provide this extra effect, which is needed in order to control the aircraft, okay? So that was the reason. Now, when, when Boeing engineers continued to develop the 737, so when it, came, when it went from the classic to the new generation ones, well then even more powerful uh, engines were fitted and they needed actually to increase the size of the, um, of the fin a bit. So the, the NGs are actually, they have fins that are about five feet higher than the, uh, the classics and the Jurassic were. But it still wasn't that much higher and the ventral, sorry, the dorsal fin is still there. There are other similar um, aerodynamic effects or um, pieces that can be added to an aircraft as well. Something called a, a ventral fin. Those are fins that are fitted under the, um, the stabilizer and under the body of the aircraft. It is quite common on um, on uh, business jets, for example. And the 737 is far from alone of having a dorsal fin. If you look at, for example, the, the turboprop, the ATR-72, it has a fairly um, pronounced dorsal fin as well. And my personal favorite, the Concorde, had it as well. Guys, I hope you liked that explanation. As always, check, send in your questions below if you have more questions about different design features. And if you like these kind of you know, design features around the 737, I highly uh, recommend you to check out my previous videos about, for example, why the engines are flat on the 737. I have a whole playlist, so just go into the playlist and watch through all of it. I'm, I'm quite sure that you're going to enjoy it. Before you go guys, I also want to send out a huge thank you and a shout out to the members of my Patreon crew. My Patreon crew are there to help me. They, they help me preview my videos, make sure I don't say anything stupid. They, uh, 
they check out and help me choose thumbnails and do all sorts of kind of support work for the channel as well as providing some financial support to the channel. If you guys are interested in joining the Patreon crew, then just go down, click the link here in the description of the video and check it out and you're more than welcome to join. The um, I always make time to answer the questions for my Patreons and the uh, higher echelons in my Patreon supporters uh, can join me for a Skype call whenever they need some moral support and things like that. So check it out. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.